Okay, thank you and welcome. Uh, so, as already said, my name is Ilpo Wilkman and I'm the regional manager for Data Core Software in the Nordics and Baltics. So, let's start. So, this is the agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, who is Data Core. I'm going to talk about the threat potential with ransomware. I'm also going to go through the classical countermeasures, how you usually do when you, get, when you run into, into ransomware. And then I'm going to talk about a feature in our product, which is called uh, continuous data protection, and describe a little bit how that, what that is and how that works. And also, obviously, how that's going to help you to, to get rid of ransomware. So let's start by talking a little bit about Data Core. Uh, so we're an American company. We've been in the IT industry for, uh, in business for 18 years, uh, and uh, we're on the 10th generation of product. We have a pretty large customer base in the world, so we have uh, plus 30,000 deployments worldwide. And uh, we have all different industries and different sizes of customers, so uh, what we're doing is a technology called software-defined storage, or storage virtualization. So that's the main business that we're doing. So we're not a tra traditional security vendor, but we do tap into some of the functionality or some of the things that is important to protect your data, so which is for uh, data security. So our slogan is the data infrastructure company. And uh, that is because even if we do software-defined storage, that's not all we do. We actually uh, we work also with the servers. We increase the performance and we give increased functionality and all that. So, so we're in the whole entire stack working from the storage up to servers. <coughs> so data core. This is a picture of what we do. So data core, we're a software vendor. So we sit on top of the hardware. Uh, so it can run in a hyper-converged solution, which we call virtual SAN, and that means that you're running everything in the same server. So you have the compute, you have the networking, and you have the storage. Everything in the same box. Everything running there as a hyper-converged solution. Then we also have something called SAN Symphony V, which is the other product. And that is when you're running your ex uh, on dedicated data core servers, which are like storage nodes managing your storage. So then you in attach something uh, external storage and present uh, uh, and use it with data core, and we present it as virtualized storage to the application servers. <laughs> And you can also add to this, so with the hyper-converged and with the traditional way of doing storage, you can always have some storage which is out in a, at a cloud vendor. So we have integration with cloud vendors, so it doesn't matter where your storage is located. If you're running data core on top of it, it doesn't matter. We manage everything from one single console. And for us, it doesn't matter if it's virtualized, uh, virtualized hosts or if it's physical hosts. So it can also be VMware, Microsoft, KVM, or whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference for us. We just present the storage to those hosts uh, as normal storage. And the benefits you get when you're using Data Core, we obviously take all these resources that you present to Data Core, the hardware resources, we pool them together and uh, protect them, which means that we create the pool, virtual pools out of the, whole, uh, the hardware, and we protect it so you get high availability, you get always continuous access to your data, you don't lose data, uh, your access to your data, and you don't lose your storage. So if, if you have storage on different locations, if one of the sites goes down, it automatically fades over to the other side, and uh, there's no downtime for the applications. <laughs> And as already said, we centralize, so everything is managed from one single console, but we also accelerate the performance for, these, uh, for, for, for the storage. So we actually broken some world records in the price performance category with, uh, with, uh, with some uh, uh, of our products. So we run it both on hyper-converged and also on the traditional storage system. So we're, we broke the world record on, uh, on price performance, on the highest number of uh, IOs, and also 
most importantly on the latency. We have the lowest latency ever. So with, this is compared to all other vendors, we broke the world record. So if we take a look under the hood, so what is it actually? We, we have uh, two products out there right now. We have a third one coming out, which is called Parallel Server, so which is going to be introduced really, really soon, which is more for, for performance. But uh, <laughs> the functionality that's under the hood, so obviously we run as a virtual server uh, or virtual layer on top of the hardware. So uh, we looking on the performance side, we have, first of all, this what's up there, Parallel I.O. That is actually the functionality where we utilize the multi-core functionality in the servers. And, uh, and with, with this, we have been able to break the world record. But it's not only that. We have performance. We have high-speed caching. So we're using the RAM in the servers for caching. We also have a functionality called auto-tiering. So we have the most granular auto tiering out there. We have up to 15 tiers of, of uh, auto tiering that you can tier between different types of storage or, or storage systems or different types of disks. We also have something called random write accelerator. And what that means is if you have uh, really write intensive uh, databases which write really small writes, write intensive. And you can take all these uh, random IOs and uh, random writes and create, turn them over to storage friendly sequential writes. So it speeds up the performance really, really well. Just by ticking that box to, to use the random write accelerator, you can get uh, SSD like performance from rotating disks. So this is really a benefit for. Uh, for databases. <laughs> then we also have a functionality called quality of service. What that means is that we can control the bandwidth that the uh, different applications get, so nobody takes over all the bandwidth. We can, so that can be controlled in the system. So jumping over first to, from, to the other side, from efficiency, we have other functionality there. So we have something called storage pooling, and that is pretty much taking all the different types of storage you have and uh, creating uh, virtual disk pools out of them and presenting it to your application. So, so the hardware is just uh, resources for your, for your environment. You don't need to have specific hardware. You can these are just the resources, and you can swap them out uh, on the fly without any downtime. So if you need to migrate or change some hardware, then you just do that on the fly and there's no downtime related to that. Theme provisioning, pretty well known in the industry, but that is so you can over allocate uh, the storage you have. So instead of buying huge amount of storage directly or a lot of hardware, you could start with less hardware and grow, uh, buy as you grow. So you over allocate the storage that you have. Also, we have some other features for data migration, and uh, so if you're moving from one storage hardware to another, you can do that uh, transparently without having any downtime. If you need to move to another data center or whatever, it's very easy to migrate. Also, we have the functionality, deduplication and compression and such things. So. Uh, all we already mentioned about the management, but we do have central management regardless of what type of storage you have, where you have it. can be different types of disks, can be flash, it can be rotating disk, it can be something external at a remote office, it can be in the cloud, doesn't matter. Everything is managed from one single console, and we also have uh, integration into other other systems like or vendors like Vvolts integration, and we have OpenStack and that kind of integration with other vendors, and also into the cloud. So now getting a little bit into the uh, the theme for today. So obviously. So software defined storage is our main or core business, but we do tap into some of the security parts of it, like high availability, always getting access to your data. But today we're going to talk about ransomware. <laughs> Maybe you have seen some of these things pop around. Uh, so this is not unusual that uh, you can get attacked by, by some malicious uh, software or piece of software that installs on your computer and uh, takes over, encrypts your data, so you don't get access to your data. And this is really troublesome because there's really, it's really, really hard to get out of this. 
So uh, ransomware, what is that? Well, obviously, it's, uh, it's a piece of, uh, small piece of malicious uh, software that you get into your system from uh, different ways, and it takes over your computer, encrypts your data, so you don't get access to your data. And uh, then, the, then uh, the criminals or the, the, the hackers or whoever has inst uh, installed this on your computer, then they require a ransom. That's why it's called ransomware, so they want you to pay to get out of it or to release your data or maybe not to publish your data that you have. So this is really, really growing rapidly. If you just take a Google, uh, Google the word ransomware, you will see that in less than 30 seconds, you will get more than 9 million res responses to or hits on ransomware. So this is really an increasing problem. So ransomware, it's not only that you have hackers sitting at home doing, trying to create malicious, uh, malicious code to, to attack you or to take over your data. You actually, they don't even have to do this because there's already off-the-shelf uh, products that they can go online and purchase this, uh, these uh, different ransomware. And there's instructions on how to do it and how to work with it. So there's, uh, they, they, it's very simple for criminals to just go and buy something, instructions and everything, and then they inject it into your uh, private systems or into corporate uh, organizations. So this is really, really growing. Uh, as it's seen before, that uh, the majority of the ransomware has been uh, targeted to, to home users, but it's increased very, very much So now on, on the corporate side. So actually, it's growing about 100% year over year from, from, uh, from, from on the corporate side. So more and more organizations are getting attacked by ransomware. This is just... Uh, an illustration what types of ransomware there are out there. So, um, obviously, this doesn't really say very much to me, I, I, only that there's lots and lots of different types of ransomware. Just to make aware that the most uh, common ones are TeslaCrypt and CTB Locker. So, these are, you might have heard of some of these, that there have been large organizations who have been hit by these, and they had got into really, really big trouble because they can't access their data, they, their production stops, and they have a real hard time getting out of it. <coughs> so, there, how do you get infected? Well, there are different ways. You could get emails from different places. You could get it from your bank or from your phone company or from uh, PayPal, Microsoft, or whoever. And they want you to, they send you something, okay, you need to click here to, to update something or some other ways. You get some email and by, ac by accident you click on that and think that you're going to do something good or they, you need to update something. What happens is that you, you get in injected by this ransomware. So uh, they take over your data and encrypt your, your computer so you won't uh, be able to use or access your data or use your computer. They might lock the whole computer. <laughs> you might also get something from Microsoft, okay? Microsoft, there comes a mail that looks like, or information that looks like, okay, you have some problem with your computer, uh, you, need to, you need to click here to update something. And you click there and you think that, okay, I'm going to fix my computer because there was a problem. Well, actually, there was not a problem. They just tricked you to click a link, so you get infected. So, also, uh, all the, the browsers, they have vulnerabilities. Even if they're trying to stay be up to date and they're always doing updates and so on, but the bad guys, they're much faster. They're always a few steps before. So they find and exploit these uh, vulnerabilities. So if you're just browsing the web or going to Google or whatever, it might be that you click on something and you, or, or you get redirected to some, some page. And just by going there, you don't even have to click anything. You get something like uh, drive-by drive by, uh, uh, attacks. So, so it means that just by passing that web page, you get uh, infected from some ransomware. Also, using Dropbox-like functionality, there's, there can be harmful code. So there's many, many ways without you even knowing that you're getting infected. You, you don't need to be doing anything stupid or bad. It's just they, they are 
uh, much uh, much ahead of us. So so even if you do just browsing around like normal, you might get infected even if you're careful. So the the usual thing is that they take over your hardware uh, hard drive and encrypt it. But they can also take over, if you connect it to some kind of network drive or some, some file share or something, then they can also take over and uh, encrypt the whole file share. So it, imagine if they come, if you get, inject, get uh, some, uh, uh, some malware on your computer when you're at work and you're in, connected to some kind of file share and the file share gets locked so nobody can access the data there. This would be really, really harmful. Uh, so, so, so you don't even have to be actually connected to that file share. It's enough that you have it in your, in your cache, in your computer. If you have the password or something, they can, they can get into, into your shares and, and encrypt the whole file share so you don't get access to that. So there, there's really caution to be made here. So it's really easy to get uh, hit by this. So the classical countermeasure or what usually is done, well, um, first we're going to look at uh, uh, what to do. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, I'll just see here, clicking too fast, yeah, that's it. So, so if you get hit by, by uh, this ransomware, so what the first thing you, you, they ask you to do is, okay, you need to pay, you are going to release your data if you pay it, or we're not going to publish your data. but. You should never do that because there's no guarantee that you will get your data back or you will, they will unencrypt your hard drive. It might be, even be that they don't even have a tool to unencrypt it. They just take your money and run. So yeah, there's no guarantee if you pay the money for, for unencrypting, you, you might not even get your, your data back. So that is not a good idea. The other way around is, well, obviously, if you have done backups, the other idea or way to do it is to revert back to a backup. But then the question is the recovery point objective. It means that when did you do your last backup? How far back do you need to, to revert? So how much data will you actually lose? Because it might have been one uh, half a day ago, so you lost half a production days of data. So this, uh, you, you will obviously be in risk of losing a lot of data if you don't have any good tool to manage this. So you have to do some kind of you know, calculation, how much data do we need, will we lose and so on. So <clears throat> Also, it might even be so that you don't even have access to your backup. It might be encrypted too, so then you're in really big trouble because how are you going to revert to a backup if you're not even accessing it, if it's also encrypted? <laughs> and also, even if you revert, let's say you revert six hours back with the latest backup or half a day or, or something, it might be that it takes several hours to get back up and running. So that means that you don't only lose the time or the data that's being produced for half a day, you might even lose half an, uh, yet another day because it takes time to get up and running. So explaining this a little bit with the recovery point objectives and the recovery time objectives. So what this means is, I'll see if I can get the pointer working here. Okay, so what it means is, if you had your last backup here, maybe it was done, you do it once a night or something, and then you keep running for half a day or something and you get hit by some ransomware here. So, uh, so it takes a little while before you get the alerts, okay. It takes time, okay, well, hello, we're getting attacked, we, we're not accessing our data. So when you come here and you have detected that you're, you're getting attacked, then you need to take a decision, okay, what are we going to do, how are we going to handle this, so what do you do? So this is also some time that gets lost here, and it means that from, from the last backup, it goes a long time and there's a lot of data created during this time, which you might never be able to recover. But also, looking at the recovery time objective, that's the other way of looking at it, it's not only how, how far back do you have to go to be, get up and running again, but how long time will it get until you have taken your decisions, how do we get up and running and, and how do we revert the data, and maybe it takes a long, long time to get up and running again. And that means that you pretty much lost maybe a whole working day or, or the data from, that's been created the whole day. So you might have lost a lot of productivity and uh, a lot of data. 
So backup, it's a good tool, but it's, uh, you will still lose a lot of data. So let's have a look at the functionality that I was talking about. I mentioned the uh, different functionality uh, that we had in a product, but I didn't talk about CDP yet. So CDP is a functionality called continuous data protection. And what it is, it's something similar to when you look at uh, cable TV, you might be able to record a program. And so you can see that, okay, I can revert. I want to, oh, I, start, I pause my film. I want to revert back and I want to look at any time. So this is pretty much the same, but with the data. So you can revert to pretty much any time and place. You can record up to two weeks of data and revert to any time and place with this. Uh, so it's very easy to go back to any point in time within seconds and also to, to just restart from there. As said, you put, you can, you're told all the time recording the data. Uh, here's your production environment and here's, you have a separate CDP array which records the data. So it means your production is not affected by this CDP. It's that it doesn't take bandwidth or anything. It doesn't uh, affect your production data because it's recorded in a separate array. <laughs> so, you, so when something happens, you have these time pointers so you can revert to in, within seconds to any time in, in, in place in time to, to be up and running again. Comparing the CDP functionality, with what's out there. So normally, I was talking about backup. Maybe you do the backup once every night, and then you keep running, and uh, you hit some, uh, you hit some uh, malware here, some, uh, some ransomware in the middle of the day or something. And uh, then when you, back, when you revert to your latest backup, you will obviously, <coughs> you will obviously Okay, it's not gonna follow me. So you will obviously lose the data that was created here. So this is, this is uh, the, uh, how much data you will lose. And also it takes time to, re to revert or to get up and running from restoring from the tape library. So the other way around is snapshots. It's a little bit more granular, so you do that much more frequently. So if you get hit and use snapshots, Okay, then maybe you don't have to revert as long back as you had to with this backup. Maybe you just need, but maybe it was half an hour or an hour ago you had your la latest uh, snapshot. That means that uh, you will still lose maybe half an hour or an hour of data that's been created. So still, that's not maybe, uh, may, that, that might be critical because of your, depending on what business you're doing. So doing this with CDP, we create, we're recording all the time, so this is really, really granular. As I said, within seconds, you can revert to pretty much any time, place in time within seconds just before the, the incident happened. So, so you can start, restart from seconds before it happened when you know you have the last point with good data. So it significantly uh, reduces or, improve, or improves the recovery point objectives and the recovery time objectives. You get, uh, you, you discover really, really fast and you, you go back. You don't need to lose anything because you just go back to the seconds before it happened and, and you're instantly up and running. So you don't need to uh, revert a, a backup or anything. You're just uh, up and running immediately. So this is just an illustration of how it works. So obviously we're recording for up to two weeks of data, and if something happens, you can in, you can also inject good known uh, checkpoint or markers. If you have databases, maybe you want to know, okay, if I revert my database, will it be crash consistent? So you can all the time inject some markers where you know that you have really con crash consistent data. So it will be easy to revert to the latest uh, point in time when you know you had good data. So CDP, these applications, so obviously it's independent from backup windows because this is, uh, this is something that's going on continuously. It's happening all the time in the background. It's, you don't need to wait for a backup window or anything. So, so and obviously it uh, improves the recovery point objectives and the recovery time objectives because you can revert just a little bit to the latest good known point and you can get up and running immediately. So also, if you have run into ransomware and you have lost some data, then uh, you could just uh, 
uh, send, take the, the, the data that you couldn't recover and send it for forensic analysis to some, uh, some, uh, some uh, security vendor to see, okay, what was it that hit us? Can we maybe recover this data or can we protect us from future incidents? So I'm gonna speed up a little bit here. <coughs> uh, okay. So yeah, what all, already talked a little bit about this, but after getting sh uh, hit, uh, what would you do? So you would shut down the computers that been infected. You would identify, as said, within seconds the latest good known data and just uh, get up and running from there immediately. So it's really, as said, multiple rollback points. So you can have the consistent data, so you just need to revert to the latest good known point and be up and running pretty much immediately. <clears throat> so just a little bit to end with some uh, common sense. So this doesn't replace your backups, you still need to be, do backups. This is just an ongoing two weeks, up to two weeks uh, recording data. So when you get new days, so it will empty out in the background and it will fill up in the, in the beginning. So, so you still need to do your backups as normal. This is just to protect you so you can revert exactly to any time and place within two weeks. And uh, well, it doesn't create any break in media. That means that you don't need to change or go, send your data to some tape library or, and then revert to any tape library because everything is in the same place all the time. It's on your, on your CDP array, so it's immediately accessible. And it also doesn't replicate data to any disaster recovery site. If you have a resource recovery site, you still need to uh, replicate your data there. So, and it doesn't replace common sense. So, I see I'm starting to get to the end, so I need to finish this off with a summary. So, uh, ransomware, uh, it's not a myth, it's out there, and it's really, really growing year over year, uh, really rapidly. And this is for criminals to take over your uh, data and get money from it. So you need to... <coughs> So, so it's a local threat, it's, it's, it's for your uh, servers and uh, your computers. It takes over and, and uh, encrypts it. So never pay money to the to hostesses, you, will, you, won't, you won't get your data back. And also, most important, create awareness with your users so they don't click on links and stuff and, uh, and uh, don't do anything stupid. So awareness among users and to get a really good uh, solution for recovering. Thank you.